MPs are voting on a new nuclear future, but it's old Labour divisions which are exposed tonight. Theresa May led calls for a replacement of the Trident submarine fleet. The Commons is expected to back it in the next few minutes. But Jeremy Corbyn is again isolated from his MPs. Also on News at 10 tonight. Russia's state-sponsored doping at the Sochi Winter Olympics. Now the whole nation could be banned from Rio with just 18 days to go. First the silence, then the booze. Anger at the French Prime Minister as the Nice attacker's interest in Islamic extremism emerges. But don't panic, here's Boris Johnson making his Brussels debut as Foreign Secretary. What could possibly go wrong? This is ITV News at 10 with Nina Hussain. Good evening. The Prime Minister said she wasn't going to gamble on Britain's safety as she opened a Commons debate about our nuclear deterrent. The government is committed to replacing the submarines which carry Trident and MPs in Westminster are expected to vote in favour of a new generation of them in the next few minutes. This is the scene in the Commons now as MPs vote. Not everyone supports the idea. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has spent his whole political career opposing nuclear weapons. Today, the deep divisions in his party were laid bare again as one after another, his MPs stood up to disagree with him. If this submarine ever has to fire the nuclear missiles it carries, it will have failed as a deterrent. Many MPs think it's a waste of money, but more think it an insurance policy worth renewing, including the new Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, there is no greater responsibility as Prime Minister than ensuring the safety and security of our people. That is why I have made it my first duty in this House to move today's motion so we can get on with the job of renewing an essential part of our national security for generations to come. Before long, she was asked one of the most important questions a Prime Minister can ever answer. Is she personally prepared to authorise a nuclear strike that could kill 100,000 innocent men, women and children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And and I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, the whole point of a deterrent is that our enemies need to know that we would be prepared to use it. The first Vanguard nuclear-armed submarine entered service in 1994. In 2007, MPs overwhelmingly approved Vanguard's replacement. In the early 2030s, the current submarines are to be retired, by which time the successor subs should be completed. Now, work has already started, and some in Labour believe the vote is a tactic to expose their divisions. Jeremy Corbyn is against the nuclear deterrent. I make it clear today that I would not take a decision that kills millions of innocent, innocent people. I do not believe the threat of mass murder is a legitimate way to go about dealing with international relations. But his party policy is for the subs and his backbenchers accused him of reneging on a deal to make that clear. Last year, party conference voted overwhelmingly in favour of maintenance of the nuclear deterrent. So why aren't we hearing a defence of the government's motion from the dispatch box now? Yeah. Party policy is also to review our policies. That is why we have reviews. The SNP are more united on Trident. None of them want it. But Trident fights no injustices. Trident is an immoral, obscene and redundant weapons system. And the vote on Trident is one of the most important this Parliament will ever take. For a while, a familiar figure sat on the Tory backbenches. David Cameron did not speak before leaving the chamber. Until last week, the final instructions in the submarine's control room carried his signature. Now it's Theresa May's government replacing the Vanguard subs and her signature on the letters in the submarine's safes. Carl Dinan, News at 10, Westminster. Our political editor, Robert Peston, is in Westminster tonight. Robert, this vote will go the government's way, but that's not really what is, this is about, is it? Well, certainly when people look back on this debate, they won't speak with it, speak of it with awe as one of the great intellectual debates, but they will certainly think it the, one of the more surreal 
Why is that? Well, because you had a Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who opposes Trident, representing the anti-Trident views of the Scottish National Party, the anti-Trident views of the one Green MP, the anti-Trident views of Nick Clegg of the Liberal Democrats, but broadly being opposed by almost all his own MPs. Now, you might think that would be highly damaging for Mr Corbyn, but actually his own MPs could not hold him in more contempt than they already did. And actually his anti-Trident views are pretty popular with Labour members who of course will be choosing the next Labour leader. So in a funny sort of way, Theresa May, by holding this uh, debate has done him a favour, she may have made him a little bit stronger. That, you might think, would serve her interests, but actually it probably isn't helpful to the Prime Minister for Labour to be, to be perceived to be such a rabble because it makes it much harder for her in those circumstances to maintain discipline in her own party. Goodness, complicated times. Labour's leadership contest has moved into the next stage today. It has. We had the hustings, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Owen Smith and uh, Angela Eagle all making presentations to the Parliamentary Labour Party Labour MPs. Those MPs, uh, as I've just said, couldn't have a lower op opinion of Jeremy Corbyn, and so they're never going to say nice things about his performance. They said it was not very impressive. Good things said about both Owen Smith and uh, Angela Eagle. Um, as we speak, it does look as though the young Welsh Labour MP, Owen Smith, has the edge. And it also looks as though there could well be a deal between the two of them for one of them to emerge tomorrow as the sole challenger to Jeremy Corbyn. If it's Owen Smith, well, in those circumstances, Frankly, that would be, I think many people would regard that as really rather extraordinary. We've got the second female Tory Prime Minister and we would still be nowhere in sight of seeing even a permanent female Labour leader. All right, Robert, thank you. Russia should find out tomorrow whether it will be completely barred from the Rio Olympics 18 days before the Games begin. An explosive new report has exposed systematic, sophisticated and state-sponsored drugs cheating at the 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics in Russia. In response, President Putin issued a statement of both defiance and denial, warning the Olympic movement is on the verge of splitting. We all knew that some Russian athletes cheated, but after today's report into this, the Sochi Winter Games of 2014, we now know the deception was one of the greatest in the history of sport. A state-sponsored doping cover-up across 30 disciplines, winter and summer Olympics, professional sport and even the Paralympics. The report's independent author, the respected lawyer Dr Richard McLaren, revealed underhand subterfuge that wouldn't have looked out of place in a John le Carre spy novel. The Sochi laboratory operated a unique sample swapping methodology to enable doped Russian athletes to compete at the Winter Olympic Games. The methods used there were staggering. The report claims any urine tests from a drug-taking Russian were secretly swapped overnight for clean samples. The test tubes passed through a man-made mouse hole by a secret service agent disguised as a sewage engineer. There was nothing accidental about this. This was an organisation set up to cheat, which involved uh, everybody at every single level. President Putin said this evening any officials named in the report will be suspended, but he says he wants more evidence-based information before coming to any conclusions. Russian track and field athletes are already barred from this summer's games in Rio, but now the entire Russian team could be banned. I think um, with the news that's come to the front today, then obviously something very positive has got to be done. I think to ban them from Rio is the first step, but basically ban them from international competition until they can sort their drug problem out. The International Olympic Committee will convene via a conference call tomorrow to discuss their next move. What do you think it will be then? 
Well, it's pretty obvious it's going to be a ban, I think. Uh, the executive board of the IOC is going to meet tomorrow via telephone, as I said. They said in a statement tonight they're going to examine the report, take our first decisions, which may include provisional measures and sanctions with regard to the Olympic Games in Rio, which I suppose is a roundabout say, way of saying we might ban them. Um, the IOC's president, Thomas Back, has issued a statement tonight. He described the Commission's findings as a shocking and unprecedented attack on the integrity of sport and the Olympic Games, and he pledged to enforce the toughest sanctions available. And to be honest, Nina, I can't see anything other than a ban being acceptable. We shall see tomorrow. Ian Payne, thank you. 40,000 people gathered along the promenade in Nice today to remember the 84 victims of the Bastille Day attack. The first details about how and when the man who carried it out became radicalised are now emerging. More on that in a moment. First, how the silence was broken with anger from people who claim their government isn't doing enough to protect them. Just days ago, people ran for their lives down this promenade. Today, those whose lives were lost were honoured by thousands. A single cannon round marked the start of a minute's silence. It became a minute of applause. This nation is hurt, but proud. But amid the pride, there is anger, and the fury was directed at France's Prime Minister today. Murderer, they shouted, resign. In this part of France, there is a belief the government has failed to protect the people. 40,000 were on the streets today, and most shared the anger. I saw five dead bodies, and I stayed for two hours with a dad, with his son dead, with the head crash, with his wife dead, with another two men dead. I was there when it happened. We hate our French government, which create this mess, create this chaos. I agree with the minister because uh, how can you... The problem is in France, it's all the time in the same problems, that we have to find a solution. Finding a solution is not to make in the war in the other countries and we want to be safe in your country. It's impossible. Tonight, as three days of official mourning come to an end, the people of Nice have formed a human chain to move the flowers that have been laid. Solidarity and support in the darkest of times. Emma Murphy, News at 10, Nice. Police who've been searching through Mohamed Boulouel's background say they discovered he'd only recently been radicalised. In the run-up to the attack, he'd been searching the internet for material about radical Islamist movements. The lorry's final route is marked with flowers. One bundle at each spot where a victim was killed. 84 in total, and then an 85th, a pile of rubbish and growing where the attacker was killed. This video emerged today showing the attack, but was this wanton violence by a deranged killer, a political act by a terrorist, or both? Prosecutors have concluded that it was premeditated, but described the attack as sudden fascination with self-styled Islamic State. Un ordinateur. He said, the search of a computer found in his house indicates that several internet searches were carried out from July the 1st on festivities organized on the Promenade des Anglais and on the fireworks in Nice, and on videos of deadly vehicle accidents, and I quote, horrific deadly accidents and also shocking video, not for the faint-hearted. The mother of one of those suspects said all the police have told her about her son is that he's alive. They had much more to say to the attacker's ex-wife and her lawyer during two days of questioning.
When I talked to her, she said to me, but it's impossible that that guy who was my husband did that action. Then she realized, Donc she was shocked for the victim. And don't forget that she was also a victim. Because for a long time, that guy was violent with her. The sun, sea and silence won't comfort the many victims in this heartbroken city, nor do they explain the attacker's short path towards this long road. Rohit Katru, News at 10, Nice. Some breaking news tonight, and police in Germany say a number of people have been injured by a man with an axe on a train. Up to 15 people are thought to have been hurt in the attack, four seriously, as that train was travelling through a suburb of the Bavarian city of Würzburg. The suspect has been incapacitated. Turkey's President Erdogan has a reputation as a ruthless hardliner and judged by the purge that is underway in his country, it is well deserved. Dozens more suspected coup plotters have been rounded up and paraded on television. Today, the president hinted that he wanted a return of the death penalty. Over the last three days, the Turkish government has detained thousands of people that it suspects of treachery. And it's not done yet. Early this morning, heavily armed police were at the Air Force Academy in Istanbul, where they detained four high-ranking officers. In response to the attempt to overthrow it, the government is getting tough. Some of the suspected plotters are paraded in front of the cameras. The president has promised to purge what he calls the virus that was behind the coup, and that's caused one of Turkey's key allies to voice its concerns that the crackdown might endanger human rights. So when you hear the United States say Turkey's position within NATO might be under threat if they go too far in their response, what well, do you, how do you react? Well, let's call a spade a spade. We are here, we stand united with our president and our elected government. Are you with us, with the Democrats, or are you against us? That's the question that Americans and Europeans have to ask themselves. Turkey's intelligence agency has released frightening video of the night of the coup. Heavy machine gun fire strafing its headquarters, cars turning around to avoid it, and some of their men firing back at the helicopter. It's images like these which are fueling the president's hardline reaction. The government here won't feel under too much pressure to heed those warnings from Europe and America about how harshly it responds to the coup because as it has been down the centuries, this country is the gateway to the East and it is as important now as it ever has been to the security concerns of the great powers in the West. The Americans have been using bases in Turkey to launch airstrikes on IS targets in Iraq and Syria and Europe needs Turkey to stem the flow of refugees from the Syrian war, providing shelter for them so that they don't try to cross the sea. There's that humanitarian component, of course, um, and then there's the security component, which is trying to uh, crack down on any Europeans who may be trying to cross into Turkey um, to, to join Daesh or the Islamic State. Even on visits to his supporters, Mr Erdogan is surrounded by a crowd of security guards now. He's been shaken by the coup attempt and stern words from the West won't stop him from seeking vengeance. Geraint Vincent, News at 10, Istanbul. The deep alarm in Europe and the NATO countries at events in Turkey surfaced in Brussels today. Not just alarm at the thwarted attempt to unseat a democratically elected leader, but fears about the harshness of Turkey's subsequent crackdown. And it was into this sombre agenda that Boris Johnson made his entry as Britain's new post-Brexit foreign secretary. The US Secretary of State's visit to Brussels had been long planned, but the timing was fortunate. Both Europe and the US are gravely concerned about what's happening in Turkey, both by the attempted coup and by the backlash. The language today was uncompromising. Even Turkey's NATO membership is at risk if the country abandons democracy. NATO also has a requirement with respect to democracy, and NATO will indeed uh, measure very carefully 
uh, what is happening. And as for restoring the death penalty, well, that would kill Turkey's hopes of joining the EU stone dead. No country can become an EU member state if it introduces that penalty. That is very clear. And it's not just Turkey, but yet another terrorist attack on European soil that is adding to the air of permanent crisis here. The foreign minister standing for a minute's silence in memory of the victims of Nice. So it was an untypically serious, almost sombre Boris Johnson who emerged from his first meeting with his new colleagues, colleagues who last week had been none too keen on his appointment. Obviously I was making the crucial point from the UK's perspective, which is that uh, we must give effect to the will of the people and uh, Brexit must mean Brexit. But that in no sense means the end of Britain's commitment, participation in Europe and our support for all sorts of European ventures, particularly on the foreign policy field. Thanks how, a lot, everybody. How was your Take reception? Thank you. How was your reception Thank you. there? Very good. Thank you. And that was all he would say about it. Others in the meeting talked about him showing humility. And Germany's foreign minister clearly wanted to put last week's shock at this appointment behind him. Last week you called him outrageous. Your French colleague called him a liar. Is he a man you're going to be able to do business with? Europe is surrounded by conflicts right now that we must solve, he said. So we really don't have time to be worried about any personalities. So Boris Johnson still has bridges to build and fences to mend, but he's arrived at the Foreign Office at a serious time. And however angry they may be here with Britain on these issues of terrorism, Turkey, cooperation with NATO, Britain is still a major player. James Mace, News at 10, Brussels. The attack which killed three police officers in Baton Rouge yesterday was planned and it was an assassination. Tonight, police released new video footage of the shooting, saying the former Marine who carried out the attack had been in the city for several days. Gavin Long, they said, had deliberately come to Baton Rouge to do harm. These pictures have just been released of the gunman as he hunted for his victims. An ambush that police say involved deliberately targeting and assassinating officers. The gun battle left three police officers dead and another critically wounded. <laughs> Among those killed was Montrell Jackson, the father of a baby boy, four months old today. This is my message to you. And this is the gunman, Gavin Long, a former US Marine who served in Iraq. He chose his 29th birthday to murder the officers. Having posted videos making clear, he regarded peaceful protests as a waste of time. You gotta fight back. That's the only way a bully knows to quit. He doesn't know words. He can't understand words, I promise you. He doesn't understand protests. Just two weeks after the Dallas ambush and another community, another police department is grieving. Amazing grace. Many people are feeling not just scared, but also sensing a breakdown of law and order. And it's just sad for everybody involved, all the families, the country, everything. It just needs to stop. We all need to come together. It's, it's ridiculous. The violence has gotten completely out of hand. The recent street protests in Baton Rouge followed a police shooting of a black man, his aunt pleading for calm. When these people call these families, they tell them that their daddies and their mamas not coming home no more. I know how they feel because I got the same phone call. No justice, no justice, no peace. That's what we're calling for. Stop this killing. Stop this killing. There have been protests in Cleveland as well, where the Republican Party convention began today. And inside the hall, they started proceedings with a moment of silence for the fallen officers. Thank you. But out of tragedy comes a Republican ambition to define their party as one of law and order. Republicans see a political opportunity in this, regularly accusing the President and Hillary Clinton of being too supportive of protesters and too hostile to the police. The accusation is largely false, but in this election that barely matters. Race and policing are now at the heart of this fiery campaign season. 
Robert Moore, News at 10, Cleveland. And Robert will be answering questions live on our Facebook page about the shootings in America and the Republican Party convention after the programme. With America seemingly more divided by the day and those divisions taking centre stage in the election campaign, we wanted to hear what ordinary Americans feel about the state of their nation, why certain communities are alienated and are angry, why people are looking outside established politics for answers to their problems, why race has once again become a battleground. We visited three different communities which reflect the new reality of the home of the brave and the land of the free, the divided states of America. Our first snapshot is from North Carolina in the city of Fayetteville, where half the population is black. In their own words, three residents of the city share their fears that America could be sliding back to the dark days of racial violence and division. What well, what's going on in America is that the black community is tired. We're frustrated. We're angry. And with all the black men being shot down in the streets, we feel like that we're not valued as human beings. My name is Pastor Larry Wright, and you know I've been working in this community for many years. The market house was a place where they sold slaves, they sold property, and uh, blacks were considered property in those days. But we're moving away from that now. We don't need negative uh, politicians, people breathing out cruelty and bigotry and hatred at a time when we're trying to go forward. The key will let me go. Our road is one of those areas in ghetto America that people like to call it hood. It has a bad reputation due to the drugs and the poverty, but for the most part, it's just a bunch of people trying to make it. My name is Joaquin Jones. I'm 26 years old. I was struck at a Donald Trump rally in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I turned face. So it was like, I never really, I didn't know who hit me to the next day. The biggest fear in Fairville, biggest problem people feel with the election is that we're gonna get someone who does not care about us. That we're gonna get somebody who only cares about someone who fits in their tax bracket or income range. The rhetoric that Donald Trump is, is doing across this country at these rallies is causing division, it's causing anger, it's causing people to become violent, it's causing people to fear of what is the future of this country and it's dividing the country in half. The Bible said what comes from, what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart and who you are will eventually show and we see who he really is. Donald Trump is someone I do not trust. I mean, I do not, some of the stuff he says, I do not like. I don't think he talks about the issues. I think, if, you know, if you're running for president, you should keep to the issues and what you're gonna do to make things better, not criticize everybody else. My name is Ann Mathis, and I've lived in Fayetteville since 1978. What we do is we give refurbished and new bicycles to um, underprivileged children. I think he's in it to prove other people wrong. That's what I think. I think he's in it to make himself look good. I don't think he's in it to help anybody but Donald Trump. That's the way I feel. You know, you listen to him talk and it's, he doesn't answer a direct question. He always has something controversial to say. He never answers a direct question. When Trump says making America great again, what that means is Let's go back to the good old boy times where whites were in power, where whites was in control, blacks were oppressed. Let's go back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Let's make America great for whites again and not for all.
we'll hear from the Hispanic community of Phoenix, Arizona. It's a city with a big Mexican population where immigration and Donald Trump's promise to build a wall are big political stories. News at 10 has been covering the stories of veterans who are struggling to rebuild their lives after leaving the armed forces for years now. That so many are still struggling is shocking. Tomorrow, a new survey by a charity working with veterans will reveal alarming details about the age of those who feel let down in their financial plight. We have those details tonight and they show that for a generation of young men, the battle goes on. Um. 28 years old, I should be able to stand on my own two feet. I'm an ex-soldier. It's uh, not somewhere where I thought I'd be. Four years ago, Nick Underdown was serving his country in Afghanistan. Today, he's one of hundreds of young military veterans struggling to cope after returning to civilian life. It feels like failure all the time, keeping having to try it job after job after job and not getting anywhere. After six years in the Royal Artillery, Nick has returned to his hometown of Eastbourne looking for work. He says he'll do pretty much anything, but one unexplained rejection follows another. Would you like cereal? Yes. Uh, some juice? A once proud soldier now relies on handouts from the food bank. Uh, some fish, yeah. tin fish. He knows other ex-servicemen who steal to eat. He has gone hungry. I've gone days without food before. A few days at least, yeah. Nick sleeps on friends' sofas. Like many veterans, he suffers from mental health problems that surfaced after two tours of Afghanistan and make readjusting to civilian life even harder. You can dig a hole and you can keep digging and you can't see the top again. I've been there. It's not great. A new survey by a major charity shows they're helping the highest number of young veterans ever, with 45% of those being helped under the age of 44. And of all those surveyed, more than a half can't afford basic essentials, and a similar number are unemployed. Three quarters of them have long term illnesses. An MOD promise to do more was welcomed tonight by a former Army Chief of Staff. When we come home, we owe them something, and that is why the covenant should be enforced. I think the government has tried to do it, but all I would say is it's got to try a bit harder. Without additional support, Nick Underdown sees a bleak future. You're leaving a generation of blokes out in the dark, really. It needs to be, it needs, it needs to be sorted. Nick Underdown ending that report. Just before we go, MPs have approved the renewal of Trident by 472 votes to 117. Tom is here tomorrow from me. Good night.